This is a summary of glomerular diseases. We're going to be talking about 11 diseases, and the names of those are listed across the left there. Before we begin, this is a normal image of a normal histological section of the cortex of the kidney, where you could see a normal glomerulus, a normal proximal convoluted tubule, a normal distal tubule, and this is what the normal feature should look like. And this can kind of serve as a reference to some of the other histology images that we're going to see as, as we talk about these 11 diseases. In addition, before we begin with the, with the diseases, we can break them up into a few sections to help us remember them. We have the nephrotic diseases, diseases that show nephrotic symptoms. That's definitely worth knowing. Uh, helps you identify them to begin with, helps you separate them in your head, helps you keep them organized. We have the nephritic diseases, the last five or six there. And then in the middle, we have diabetes, amyloid, and lupus, which are primarily systemic diseases, but have some glomerular manifestations. And we're going to be talking about the effects of those systemic diseases on the glomerulus. So let's jump right into talking about the first one on the list, a nephrotic disease called minimal change disease. Minimal change disease is, as I said earlier, a primary glomerular disease with a nephrotic syndrome. It's the most common in children, especially young children. So if you see a young children in the case, then you should automatically think maybe it's minimal change. On light microscopy, you do see a minimal change. That's where the name comes from. It looks pretty normal. The immunofluorescence is negative, so you do not see immune complex deposition on minimal change disease. Electron microscopy, on the other hand, is where you see the abnormality. You see foot process effacement, and that can be shown in that figure, in that cartoon figure on the, on the right there. The green, uh, the green section, the green cells, are the foot processes, which kind of make that outside barrier uh, between, between the lumen of the, of the capillary and the lumen of the, of the tubule. And that the foot processes are kind of smeared together uh, on, on electron microscopy, and that's called foot process effacement. Some secondary causes of minimal changes. Well, first of all, the, the primary cause of minimal change disease is idiopathic. Some secondary causes of minimal change disease include cancer, infection, uh, an, at, an atopic state, and some drugs. And it's in general associated with lymphoma uh, cancer, um, which, which would be a secondary cause, and the use of NSAIDs. Next, we have focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. This is another primary glomerular disease, also nephrotic. We're still in the nephrotic section. Now, focal, this, the, the name here reveals a lot to us. Focal means that some of the glomeruli are affected, not all the glomeruli in the kidney. Segmental means that some parts of the glomerulus is affected. Some parts of each individual glomerulus um, is, is sclerotic, not the entire glomerulus. And that's shown in the histology image shown there. So again, on light, on light microscopy, we see segmental glomerular scarring. We see some hyaline material, which are essentially deposits from the plasma. On immunofluorescence, we do see positive. It does light up for immunoglobulins and complement in a granular appearance. And we also see segmental effacement on electron microscopy as well, similar to what we saw in the previous minimal change disease. Again, primary FSGS is idiopathic. We do have some secondary causes here. It could be genetic, could be related to infections, particularly HIV, it could be related to drugs like heroin, sickle cell, and obesity. And this disease is most common in blacks. Next, we have membranous glomerulonephritis. This is another nephrotic disease. It's primarily a glomerular disease. On light microscopy, we see what the name implies, capillary wall thickening. It's membranous. You see thickening of the membranes. This is due to IgG and C3 immune complex that has deposited in these membranes. On immunofluorescence, it's positive, as, as we said earlier, for IgG and C3 in the capillary, and it's a granular pattern. And EM is where we really see how this IgG and C3 deposits. On EM, we see immune complexes in the subepithelial space. So this is right below the, the podocytes, right below the podocytes. And you can kind of see that image, uh, that image at the bottom right there, we see subepithelial deposits. Those black dots are subepithelial. And as the disease gets worse, those deposits get bigger. Primary cause of this is the production of an antibody against a protein in the podocytes. That protein is called antiphospholipase A2 receptor. So when the body makes antibodies against that, that antibody is going to collect in the subepithelial space. And, uh, and, and appear on electron microscopy. 
We have some secondary causes for membranous glomerulonephritis that includes cancer, lupus, NSAIDs, HPV, hepatitis B, syphilis, and uh, going along with these secondary causes, the antigen can be hepatitis B or cancer. Next, we have diabetic nephropathy. Di diabetes is, of course, a systemic disease. Um, this is the secondary nephropathy, secondary to systemic diabetes, and uh, it's also presenting with nephrotic syndrome. This can be caused by diabetes mellitus types 1 and 2, and it's essentially the, the, the pathogenesis is the accumulation of glycosylated proteins in the glomerular basement membrane and the mesangium. So having high blood sugar levels causes plasma proteins to be glycosylated. It kind of makes them sticky. You can think of these sticky proteins sticking to the GBM and the mesangium, which causes them to accumulate in those areas. On light microscopy, you're going to see mesangial expansion to the point of having KW nodules, and that's pretty obvious in that image to the right there. And on immunofluorescence, you're going to have linear staining of IgG as opposed to granular staining. So there's pretty good distribution of the accumulated glycosylated proteins in the glomerular basement membrane. So it does show a linear stain. And on, electric, and on electron microscopy, the GBM is going to appear thickened because of those plasma proteins accumulating there as well. Treatment for diabetic nephropathy is to reduce blood sugar, to reduce blood pressure, and to avoid nephrotoxins. And this is uh, by far the most common cause for end-stage renal disease in the United States. Next, we have another systemic disease, amyloid nephropathy. Again, this causes a secondary nephropathy with nephrotic syndrome. It's caused by the accumulation of polypeptides. Two big polypeptides cause nephropathy of the amyloid variety, especially AL amyloid and AA amyloid. On light microscopy, we're going to see thickening in the mesangium again. We're going to find a bunch of amorphous pink pale material in the glomerulus. We can confirm this with a stain called Congo Red. Look at it under birefringent light, and if it lights up, then we know that it was amyloid. On immunofluorescence, we look for monoclonal staining of accumulated amyloid protein. So a lot of times when you stain for kappa and lambda light chains, you see them both uh, light up at the same time. In this case, we have monoclonal staining. So you, it's possible to, to stain just for the kappa and have just kappa light up and have gamma not light up. So it's, that's a little different. Uh, that, that helps you differentiate it from some of these other diseases. You have monoclonal staining. And on electron microscopy, you might actually be able to see these proteins as randomly arranged fibrils. And finally, amyloid nephropathy is associated with rheumatoid arthritis. That's specifically the amyloid A variety, and it's also uh, associated with multiple myeloma, and that's specifically the AL variety. Next, we have lupus nephritis. Lupus is ranked from 1 to 6, where 6 is the worst case of the disease. Lupus essentially is caused by antigen-antibody complexes that deposit in the glomerulus. And these activate complement, which lead to proliferation of the mesangium, and a bunch of neutrophils come in, infiltration of PMNs. So it's, a, it's, it's definitely an immune reaction. It starts with antibody-antigen complexes that deposit, followed by complement, followed by proliferation of the mesangium, and neutrophil infiltration. On light microscopy, we can see some of that. We can see endocapillary and mesangial proliferation. Also sometimes see crescents here. And on the immunofluorescence pattern, everything lights up. We call this the full house pattern. On electron microscopy, we can see deposits anywhere and everywhere. And this is a, one of the few diseases that has hypocomplementemia, where you see low complement protein in the blood, specifically C3 and C4. That's because you're overusing the complement system um, in, the, in the pathogenesis of lupus nephritis. Next up, we have membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. And this one's a little unique because it has both nephrotic and nephritic. Could present with both, could present with one or the other. Um, it's kind of, kind of in between, it's kind of variable. We have two types of membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. Type one is the deposition of immune complexes 
and complement proteins. So we see some Ig and some C3, both immune and complement. This is caused by bacterial infections, by hepatitis C infections, and by malignancies, by some cancers. Type 2 is just the complement deposits, just C3, without the Ig, without the immune complexes. Also deposits, just complement. This one's caused by complement dysregulation, so perhaps too little complement protein produced, or overexpression of some complement protein, uh, usually some genetic basis to that complement dysregulation that causes type 2 membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. On light microscopy, we see capillary wall thickening with hypercellularity, and this is exactly what the name implies. We have membrano, that's capillary wall thickening, proliferative, hypercellularity. Uh, so the name tells us a lot about what we see on light microscopy, and you can see an example of that shown on the image on the right there. And on immunofluorescence, we see immune complex deposits with, or sometimes, uh, it's, it's like an and or C3 granular deposits, depending on if you have type 1 or type 2. So this can cause hypocomplementemia in either case, because both type 1 and type 2 have C3 deposits, are going to have low complement levels in the blood. So uh, the, the, the immunofluorescence will light up based on which type you have, but either way, you're going to have low complement levels in the blood. EM, similar story. You're going to have the same deposits um, depending on if you have type 1 or type 2. And the deposits in, uh, in, in this case are going to be sub, sub, excuse me, sub endothelial and in the basement membrane. Next we have IgA nephropathy. This is a nephritic, almost purely nephritic disease. We're going to see deposits of IgA. This is the first time we're seeing IgA. Um, it's, it's either going to be alone or sometimes with other immunoglobulins. And this one's also unique in that the deposits are in the mesangium. They're still granular deposits. They're still immune complexes. But this time they're in the mesangium as opposed to uh, in a, in a sub-epi or sub-endothelial space on the glomerular basement membrane. The pathogenesis of this disease is the activation of complement, which causes the proliferation of mesangial cells. So we will also see mesangial proliferation. Uh, as, as, as the next line says, on light microscopy, we're going to see mesangial hypercellularity. And that's kind of what you can see on that image on the right there. Immunofluorescence is going to show positive for IgA, as the name implies. And as we said earlier, it's a granular pattern, but it's different because this time the granules are located in the mesangium. On electron microscopy, we're also going to see mesangial deposits. So you should really be associating this IgA nephropathy with mesangial deposits, mesangial hypercellularity, and mesangial granules. Primary IgA nephropathy is idiopathic, but IgA nephropathy can also be part of a systemic disease uh, that's called IgA vasculitis. Um, it's related to a type of purpura, an HS purpura. Next up, we have acute post-infectious glomerulonephritis. This is another nephritic disease, and the key thing to remember about this is that it occurs a few weeks, usually two to three weeks after an infection. So if there's a history of an infection, usually with uh, staph, usually staph or a strep infection, and then there's kidney problems, it might be acute post-infectious glomerulonephritis. On light microscopy, you're going to see endocapillary and mesangial hypercellularity and neutrophils. I kind of associate the neutrophils uh, as being remnants of that previous infection. Helps me remember it, but you can see a bunch of neutrophils in the mesangium. On immunofluorescence, it's going to be positive for C3 in the capillary walls. Also granular staining, this time in the capillary walls again. On electron microscopy, you're going to see sub-epithelial humps, and this is somewhat similar to the sub-epithelial uh, granules that we saw in membranous glomerulonephritis, but in this case they're described as humps because they have a podocyte covering them up. And you can see that in that in that in that bottom cartoon there. And of course, because you're going to have depositions of C3 uh, in the sub-epithelial space, you're going to have hypocomplementemia. You're going to have low C3 levels in the blood. Treatment for this is just supportive. Steroids are usually not necessary. Um, usually has a pretty good prognosis. Next, we have anti-GBM disease, anti-globarular basement membrane disease. It's also nephritic. It's caused by an autoantibody to the glomerular basement membrane. I think it's specifically collagen type 4 present in that membrane. 
antibodies here recruit complement and lymphocytes, which damage the capillaries, uh, allows the capillaries to break open, and allows for proliferation and accumulation in Bowman's space. Uh, also allows for the presence or for, for the formation of crescents, which you can see in that image on the right there. Crescents are kind of proliferations in the Bowman space around uh, where the glomeruli usually ends. So you're kind of tracing it around there. Definitely a crescent in that glomerulus. On light microscopy, as I, as I just pointed out, there's crescent formation. On immunofluorescence, you'll see it's, it lights up for IgG, and this is in a linear pattern. This is because the autoantibody is binding directly to the glomerular basement membrane. So you can really see the outlines of the capillaries pretty well here, in a very linear pattern. Electron microscopy is going to be normal. And it's important to know that this disease is called good pasture syndrome uh, when it involves both the kidney and the lungs. So when you have hematuria uh, and hemoptysis, it's it, one, one of the options that you should be considering is good pasture syndrome. Next up, we have onchoglomerulonephritis. This is the last of the nephritic syndromes we're going to be talking about. This is another immune-mediated process. This time it's against the neutrophils. So ONCA stands for anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. So this time the, the neutrophils are going to be, uh, the excuse me, the antibodies are going to be inside the cytoplasm. On light microscopy, you're going to see crescents and necrosis. So necrosis, sometimes you see like a little blood spilling in the middle of the glomeruli. Crescents we already talked about. You're going to see the, the proliferation in that, in that Bowman space, kind of outlining it there. It's like a crescent formation in this glomerulus. On immunofluorescence, this is going to be posse immune. There's there's either very little or 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 nothing lights up. It's called posse immune. One way to remember this is that the antibodies that would normally light up are in this case cytoplasmic, so they're inside the cells, and you will not be seeing them light up on immunofluorescence. Electron microscopy here is normal, and it's uh, it's. There are a few kinds of onchoglomerulonephritis. One of them that's worth knowing is GPA, granulomatosis with polyangitis, also known as Wegener's disease. Another one is eosinophilic GPA called Churg-Strauss disease. This one's easily identified based on the presence of eosinophils, which are pretty characteristic on histology. And finally, there's microscopic polyangitis, which I don't think has granulomatous formation. This is like the least severe of the onchoglomerulonephritis. And that's all we have for these 11 diseases that affect the glomerulus. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.